And so at that point, um, I was headed over towards Elk Lake. And so I was going to go out to the Dix Range from there. And so I headed, I hopped into the van, um, was able to kind of nap a little bit. I think that drive is about 45 minutes or so down um, and over to Elk Lake at mm-hmm. that parking area. So um got over there you know it was nice because the day had the weather had kind of turned around by that point at least for a little bit um you know we had the sun was coming out a little bit drier and felt a little refreshed after a quick nap so we hopped out of the car and i had uh, my pacer john who was coming with me and his job was pretty much to carry all the supplies up to the top of macomb for me so that i didn't have to do that that big climb carrying a ton of weight so um, you know, we headed in and with the, the COVID parking situation now, it's an extra two mile jog on the road, but that's not, not too bad. You get to move pretty quickly through that. And then I definitely enjoy that climb up to Macomb where you can kind of see the slide for a little bit here and there. You get the, the peaks of it, um, through the trees and then you, that pop out, popping out onto the Macomb slide is just, it's breathtaking really. Like if you don't know what's coming, it really kind of catches you by a little bit of surprise but it was something I knew was coming at the same time so um a little more expected I guess than than usual and I we made you know good time it was the first time I had been running with John for the the adventure so you know we were able to find our groove and just make good time it was actually John's first high peak which was super fun so um you know he got to have that honor on the at the top and Um, when we got to the top of Macomb, I I think it was about like two hours and 15 minutes or so in maybe. Um, and you know, we, we shuffled the, the gear around a little bit. So he had what he needed to get out. And then I had my pack for the next six miles or so, um, where I would be meeting my next pacer at the, the base of the Dick's slide. So, um, that meant I was doing South Dick's Grace um hogue who who hogue. I, I say huff but uh you know everyone's got their <laughs> own their own pronunciation I've, as i've been listening to things i'm like hearing all sorts of different things i'm like i don't think i've ever really said that one out loud either um dicks and then i would drop down so all of that was on my own but um there was quite a few people out and i definitely was was running into to plenty of other hikers which was helpful and and nice to see friendly faces out there um grace was one that i hadn't done yet and so i got to do that out and back which kind of you know was fun to do something new um and those those miles are just slow i think there's not a lot of ways around it like you you think you just make good time and then you know you you hit that and everything i feel like the world kind of slows down a little bit up on on that ridge so um, just kind of made sure to focus and uh, just chip them off kind of one at a time. And I had a couple storms blow through, which also kept it interesting. It kind of felt like, you know, I was caught in that. Do I keep my raincoat on or off or on or off type of, of phase? But by the time I did descend off of Dix uh, to meet Jim, my next pacer, uh, the weather had turned around OK and it was it was pretty good. So um that was just kind of like refreshing to see him unload some of the the pack weight again and uh, get ready for the big bushwhack up to dial. And um, that was one I had scouted myself in July and I actually, I didn't quite nail it. So, so I wasn't super pumped about that when I, when I had scouted it, but Jim is a pretty experienced navigator from adventure racing and stuff. So I had given him all of the information and kind of let him know how I, how I did it wrong. And he absolutely nailed it. I was, I was super pumped to get out of that one. And, um, you know, we, we did it in well under an hour and, um, that one can just be a little, a little hairy with, with some thick brush and trees and stuff up top, but he definitely found a better path than I had (laughs) a month earlier, which was, which was cool. And so I was happy about that. And, uh, we got back up on dial and I was able to to kind of shed some clothing I had put on for, for the bushwhack. And then, um, we finished out with nipple top 
Colvin and the out and back, the out and back for Colvin and Blake, and then headed down the Gilbrook trail to the campsites there where I was camping out for the night. So day two totals ended up being 39 miles and 17,800 feet of elevation gain. So another pretty solid day, but I guess in the back of my head, I was like, well, it's shorter miles. So at least, you know, that's, that's a win. (laughs) Sure. Absolutely. So to recap day two, which started in your van at the Santanoni Trailhead, which even just listening to the story, it feels like, man, the Santanoni Trailhead, that was so long ago. And I didn't even do the hike. You're the one who did the hike. I'm just <laughs> listening to the story. Uh, the Santanoni Trailhead, you slept in your van. You got your four hours rest at night, which is how you dubbed it. Um, 2.45 a.m. start walking down the Santanonis to the Express Trail, up to Santanoni, down to Cooksacraga, up to Panther, out via the Bradley Pond Trail, and then the drive to Elk Lake over to the Dix Range, which you were able to get a nice nap in the van, and the sun was coming out, so that was a big boost. And then in the Dix Range, up Macomb, and then you soloed from South Dix over to Grace, Huff, and then Dix, and then down the Dix Trail, and then you still had the bushwhack to dial, which if you guys listen to the Sarah Kai's episode, she also did the same bushwhack, but in the opposite direction. So you went from Dix to dial, she went from dial to Dix, and then you got up to Dial, cruised over to Nipple Top, over to Colvin. I'm sure Blake was terrible. And then Black back to Colvin, <laughs> down the Gilbrook Trail, 39 miles, 17,800 feet of gain. Another monster day for sure. So now you're starting your, your four-hour rest period at this point. Around what time Correct. do you think that was? That was, it was I want to say it was almost like exactly the same time, 1045, that I got in um to camp so it was you know I was kind of coming in around that time and being like all right well I needed that extra hour of cushion that I had but um you know it it worked out that I wasn't having to extend my days in a way which was which was helpful so um yeah I I believe it was around 10 45 that I got into camp which meant around once again like 2 30 2 45 we were we were heading out. <laughs> Seems like a good time to stop. You know, it's like in general in life, it's like, you know, let's go to bed around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Like it's a good, like it naturally worked out to be kind of when your body's probably telling you it, it, the day is over as opposed totally. to, you know, finishing at one and starting at five or finishing at three and starting at six, you know, so that worked out. Nicely. Yeah, it, it did. And I think just with, with darkness, you're, you know, two and a half hours in or whatever it is and you're already like all right the darkness can go away so you at least get a little chunk of of that kind of pushed away and then when you wake up you're you know you only have a couple hours before you start to see signs of the sun coming up again too which is refreshing absolutely cool so uh how did how did that night go and then uh take me through day three yeah so it was good we actually had the the campsite area to ourselves so um, we, you know, had pitched a couple tents. We had three of us there. It was just myself and Jim who would come in with me. And then, uh, my boyfriend, Matt was there too, because he would be taking over pacing duties in the morning. So, um, you know, we, we did the same routine, just got down the ramen, got down the, the Doritos and the, the cookies and stuff, and then, uh, headed to bed as soon as we could. And Sleep wasn't quite as nice as, as the mattress in the van, but, um, you know, maybe that's a good thing as the days go on because you don't get too attached to the sleep factor, I guess. But um, so we, we popped out of bed around 2.30 and got our shoes on and all of that and headed out for day three. Um, we headed down the, the Gilbrook Trail and we, we took the cutoff down to Lake Road and then jogged down Lake Road over to where the I'm not sure exactly what the name for that trail would be but it's the the trail that's marked to take you up to lower wolf draw okay. <laughs> um and the we did take like you get to that that one split and you can take the cutoff for lower wolf draw which we took and um popped up did lower wolf draw and then you know and basically we're on the on the great range from there so we do lower wolf draw upper wolf draw um armstrong gothics and then you have to do probably my least favorite out and back. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's least favorite out and back right there oh my in this gosh. situation. Yeah. I mean, it's not too bad on the way out, but that climb to out to Saw Teeth is okay. 
But yeah. the whole way going down off Gothics, you're just thinking about having to climb back up that, I guess. <laughs> and you're going back. Up and over Pyramid is just, it's terrible at all times. Yeah. It's so steep. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a doozy. You know, it is a doozy, that's for sure. And, you know, luckily it kind of came early in the, in the day where we were able to be in good spirits about it. But I was definitely like, man, I, I could do without without this piece of it. Um, so you head back in. To, to gothics from the out and back um down the cables and you hit let's see basin saddleback haystack uh marcy gray skylight i don't know if i wrote those down in the correct order and my brain is still a little little mushy and tired um no, it's, it's all correct you would have done skylight before gray but close enough we'll give it yep, to you that's right um and on gray is actually where i officially became a 46er so oh, that was cool. the last the last piece of the puzzle there for me. So that was kind of a fun thing. Um, and we, we really started to pick up more traction with hikers around there too. So that was where we started to run into a lot of the people who knew what was going on and kind of giving me some cheers and, uh, taking a couple selfies and things like that. So, cool. you know, as, as low as spirits may have gotten on Saute, they definitely started rising again as we hit, uh, like the the haystack and um, gray and skylight, those are all kind of memorable ones where we ran into some people that were excited for what we were doing. So sure, um, that was that was pretty cool. And you ran into Sarah Kai's at some point in that in that. Date. I did, yes. So I guess coming off of um, gray, we would be heading down to Cliff and Redfield from there, and um, on that descent like down towards the uphill lean to i guess um that was that was the trail where you know we popped around a corner and we're looking at each other so <laughs> that was pretty fun um you know and i knew i knew she had plans to be on the great range on wednesday so i figured at some point you know unless her route had changed we would probably run into each other um it was, but it was cool to actually have that happen and to, to get to see each other and, you know, say, Hey, how's it, how's it going? And, um, you know, wish each other the best and, and get to see that like each other was still out there pushing and putting one foot in front of the other and, and all that stuff. So that was pretty fun. Uh, and so before I headed up cliff and Redfield, I had a second Pacer coming in for the day. So Aaron had hiked in through the morning to be at the uphill lean to and be able to bring in some resupply with some, some food and take, you know, kind of the lead pacing duties for the remainder of the, the afternoon and evening. So um, Matt actually stayed and kind of got some rest at the, the lean to while we did cliff and then Redfield and came back down got our stuff and then headed over to colden um and we hit tabletop and phelps and it started sun started going down on colden um i would say it was really you know we took out our lights just before going into tabletop and then um phelps was was done in the dark which was actually pretty cool when you get up there and you take a look at the sky we we all turned our lights off for a minute or so and took a look up and got to see the Milky Way and all the stars from Phelps, which was pretty insane. The, the view was super cool. And I think it's kind of one of those spots you don't really see another man-made light. So yeah, um, cool spot. I've been up there for sunset before. It's a, it's an awesome mountain for that. Okay. Yeah. So I, we enjoyed that and it was, you know, but at the same time we were, we were ready to be done for the day. Um, and so we were doing the, you know, I guess it's it's called a bushwhack off the backside of Phelps, but I struggle to really call it a bushwhack because it's it's actually a pretty nice trail. Yeah, you know, a it's trail, there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yep. <laughs> um, and it drops you right down to the Klondike lean to where I was set up to take my rest for that third night. So um, day three was a big one. Um, you know, in terms of mileage, I guess it was actually 37 miles. So the the smallest mileage I had done, but in one fell swoop like that was, was by far the largest yet. And then it had 18,400 feet of elevation gain. So it was, it was a solid day. That was definitely the, the one I knew would kind of be, you know, the, 
the one that indicated how this was going to go. Um, 